Então vamos começar os trabalhos do dia de hoje, começando com a conferência do Rafael Gebrest, que nos será apresentado por, pelo professor Oswaldo Jacóia. Por favor. Bom dia. Para mim é uma grande alegria apresentar a vocês o professor Dr. Rafael Gebrest, que eu com muito prazer conheci em Kyoto, em 2019, durante um dos congressos Schopenhauer. Uh, professor uh, Rafael Gebrecht é uh, professor assistente na Universidade de Duisburg, uh, especialista no campo de ciências sociais e filosofia, com várias publicações uh, neste campo de conhecimento e, inclusive, em relação à, à ética e filosofia moral. E será, então, uma grande alegria uh, tê-lo aqui conosco no nono Colóquio Internacional Schopenhauer no Brasil. Eu gostaria apenas de uh, informar que o professor Rafael Gebrecht fala português tão bem como nós aqui no Brasil. Uh, seja muito bem-vindo, é uma grande alegria tê-lo conosco. É uma grande freude, Ihnen, uh, Dr. Rafael Gebrecht, vorzustellen, den ich in Kyoto, in Japan, uh, 2019 kennengelernt habe. Er ist Lehrbeauftragte an der Universität Duisburg, uh, hat sehr verschiedene Arbeiten in, auf dem Gebiet der Geisteswissenschaften und Philosophie veröffentlicht und wird uns heute einen Vortrag halten. Und äh, ich muss noch hinzufügen, dass Dr. Rafael Gebrecht so gut Portugiesisch kann wie uns Brasilianer. Äh, ich überlasse ihn, äh, Ihnen das Wort. Muito obrigado. Ähm, vou aproveitar esse momento para agradecer a todos, os, a todos os organizadores por tornar possível este momento maravilhoso. É uma verdadeira honra para mim poder falar na frente de tantos pesquisadores e pesquisadoras tão excelentes e brilhantes como vocês. Sobretudo, quero agradecer a Maria Lúcia e a Oswaldo Chacoia, que conheci numa conferência na Chapau, como já falou uh, Oswaldo Chacoia. E para mim foi uh, um encontro um, verdadeiramente extraordinário, porque é bastante raro conhecer um, pessoas que são tão brilhantes e igualmente adoráveis e amáveis. E antes de ficar sentimental, uh, vou começar a minha palestra que um, vai ser em, em, em inglês, mas podem fazer-me perguntas em português e espero responder de, uma, de, de um jeito apropriado. Você não vai dividir a, a câmera? Hã? Você, você não vai dividir para passar o texto? Você ah, tem... Sim, Maria Lúcia, está combinado. Tá. Você é que eu vi no seu e-mail que você tinha mandado e vi lá o texto. Obrigado. Muito obrigada pelas palavras gentis a meu respeito. Uh, so yeah, I was just uh, thanking all the organizers for yeah having realized this beautiful ev event, and it's a great honor for me to speak in front of uh, scholars so um, brilliantly, so brilliant, and so um, outspoken like all of you. Um, I was thanking first and foremost um, Professor Maria Lucia and Professor Osvaldo Chacoya. Uh, who I met in a Japan uh, in a conference in Japan, and it was a, a real delight uh, to know people who are so bri as brilliant and as um, lovely as uh, Maria Lucia and Osvaldo Chacoya. So, um, and now I'm going to start uh, with my talk. Um, I think I'll wait until the Portuguese version is um, shown in the background. Okay. So um, I'm going to start my talk now, uh, which uh, concerns uh, 
the state and the concepts of right and wrong in Schopenhauer's um, political metaphys metaphysics. I think the air quotes will be clear after my talk. Um, so Schopenhauer's political theory and its moral implications are rarely discussed today, both in professional circles and in more general ethical debates. This may be partly because Schopenhauer's ethics is understood in principle as apolitical or individual, and partly because contemporary conceptions of ethics, due to their sheer variety and diversity, seem to take refuge in a certain relativism that no longer seeks a principal justification of human will and action. Such universal attempts as, uh, at justification as have been made in the philosophical tradition basically since Plato, nowadays often come under suspicions of metaphysics, which would have to capitulate against the background of the most diverse and mutually exclusive conceptions of ethics. Therefore, today the focus seems to be mainly uh, mainly on efforts of applied ethics related to practical questions of life, which have developed their specific political relevance only through recent technical developments or cultural achievements. The resulting mixed disciplines of bioethics, medical ethics, or even ecological and economic ethics have certainly led to the detailed clarification and multiplication of behavioral questions, but have hardly contributed to clarity in fundamental questions of ethics, be it political or individual. In particular, Schopenhauer's political theory and its foundation in a practical metaphysics to be understood ethically could be of special orientation value for the clarification of such fundamental questions. On the one hand, because Schopenhauer embeds his theory of the state in a universal justification that philosophically unfolds the political genesis of all forms of the state in the basic features of his ethics. On the other hand, because the individual in his concrete subjectivity, including his fears and worries, is not disregarded in his discussions. For Schopenhauer grounds the genesis of the state in a combination of metaphysical and contractualist elements that echo Hobbes and Rousseau, the latter often regarded in, Sch in Schopenhauer scholarship as central moments of his theory of the state. In contrast, this lecture will show that the state in Schopenhauer's theory is, ultimate, is ultimately deduced from the concepts of right and wrong, which are to be understood ethically and whose actual meaning can only be unfolded metaphysically in terms of will, and in this sense must be understood as universal. Accordingly, my talk takes place in three parts. The first part deals with the metaphysical origin of the concepts of right and wrong and the accompanying reinterpretation of traditional paradigmatic ontology, which Schopenhauer carries out on a transcendental critical basis and transforms into a universal foundational theory of statehood beyond spatio-temporal multiplicity. The second part shows how Schopenhauer on this basis develops the genesis of the state as a contract theory, which for the concrete world of appearance starts from a Hobbesian-like scenario in which the state is understood as the reasonable result of selfish particular interests. The last part shows to what extent Schopenhauer, in contrast to Hegel and Plato, actually prefers an individual ethics in which even an optimally state-generated state land of milk and honey is merely a form of affirmation of the will to live and only the will-free subject can be understood as the true bearer of, ethical, of ethically valuable predicates. This brings me, to, <clears throat> brings me to my first part. The ethical met metaphysical foundation of the concepts of wrong and right. As already indicated, Schopenhauer grounds his political theory in an imminent metaphysical view of the world as will. He already explained the nature of this will in the preceding books of his world as will and representation on the analogical transfer of our voluntative self-consciousness to the individuated manifestation of the world as representation and found its highest expression in the intuitive typologization of ideas. Accordingly, the world can be characterized in its original essence as will, which as metaphysical principle constitutes the essence of the world as far as it is not appearance. Contrary to our everyday as well as traditional use of language, this will is to be thought as the non-intentional philosophical concretion of the Kantian thing in itself beyond pre-critical types of ontology and to be conceived as a hermeneutic interpretation of both human and cosmic being. 
Through this and the following consideration, Schopenhauer radicalizes Kant's ontological conception, quote, being is obviously not a real predicate, end of quote, but a position referring to our mental faculties and following Schelling in this, equates being with willing, but willing with suffering. For Kant, as well as for Schopenhauer, it was decisive not to equate being as a real factuality with ontological perfection, or even like Leibniz and Wolf, to derive it gradually from a paradigmatically highest entity like God, but to, to reverse the understanding of being which prevailed in traditional scholastic ontology. According to Schopenhauer's conception, being as will is conceived as lack or deficiency, the negation of which leads to an affirmation of will in the world of appearances, which can only lead to the negation of the will to live through recognizing the will as a thing in itself. According to Schopenhauer, the negativity of this will already emerges in, in its analytical conceptualization, since every form of voluntative intentionality by definition tries to overcome some state of lack. Accordingly, the world which is represented in space and time shows itself as a result of the will from a metaphysical perspective exactly as it should be, because the will which principles the world has not willed it otherwise. As a result of the will which basically expresses itself clearly in everything that lives, this particular negative mode of existence within the world is also justified. So from this standpoint, Schopenhauer's atheistic metaphysics of the will therefore also assumes a justifying functions for the conditions of this world, similar to the religious conceptions of the Odyssey, which consists precisely in, in interpreting the world not as the creation of a benevolent God, but as a correlate of a destroying will that always affirms itself anew. Accordingly, the actual original sin lies in the individual affirmation of the will, the negative concomitants of which are accepted. Man experiences in this earthly suffering the consequences of his actions and therefore of his value, which results from the affirmation of the will to live. Quote, if one wants to know what people are worth morally, considered as a whole and in general, consider their fate as a whole and in general. This is lack, misery, sorrow, agony and death. Eternal justice prevails. If they were not taken as a whole unworthy, their fate taken as a whole would not be so sad. In this sense, we can say the world itself is the world judgment. If one could put all the sorrow in the world into one scale and the guilt of the world into the other, the tongue of the world certainly would certainly stand in." End of quote. The suffering of one reflects the guilt of another so that the inequality between perpetrator and victim caught in the Principium Individuationis turns out to be a metaphysical zero-sum game. Now, since the will is to be characterized as a metaphysically deficient being, which simply pushes to existence for its own sake and doesn't pursue a higher teleologically conceived goal, the conditions arising from this constitution are also reflected in the world of experience on this side. Therefore, being determines itself as an infinite overcoming of always newly appearing states of deficiency, which produce an infinite context of suffering, which constitutes the essence of the will to live. To affirm this will in itself means to the concrete individual simply to preserve its body and to mobilize its forces to this end, since the self-affirmation of the will objectifies itself in the body as an originally constitu constituted complex of needs. In contrast to the will as a thing in itself, its objectivation the phenomenal world in space and time therefore also show itself as appearing manifoldness in which different individuals meet as conflicting, conflicting manifestations of the will, which in itself is in itself undivided. Due to the imminent metaphysical interpretation of Kant's critique of human understanding, each individual finds itself in space and time only as an isolated appearance and beholds the phenomenally arranged world as mere representation or as a conglomerate of different contents of representation. Via the corporal reality mediated in self-consciousness, however, the basic principle of will can be directly experienced only in one's own ego, which results in the principle of selfishness. For to every subject of recognition, the own will to live is given directly, while the rest of the world appears only indirectly and within the limits of our cognitive apparatus, whereby the will as the vital motor of life is experienced by all individuals only in their own bodies. 
The drives and fears conveyed by this are prioritized over the needs of others and lead to the selfish attitude that is then discharged in the, in the observable confrontation of individuals acting against each other. The root of egotism is therefore also based on Schopenhauer's metaphysics of the will, which in combination with Kant's transcendental philosophical foundation leads to the fact that the will becomes accessible to each individual only in his own body. While the macrocosm as quote, objectivation of the will has the principium individuationis as its form. And thus the will appears in innumerable individuals in the same way and in each of them in both ways, will and representation completely and totally. Thus, while each is given to itself as the whole will and the whole representation, the others are first given to it only as its representation. Hence its own essence and its preservation takes precedence over all the others together." End of quote. Similar to Hobbes, this starting position leads to conflicts, which, however, according to Schopenhauer, must be understood not as natural, but as moral foundation of ethics, i.e. one that concerns the will and subsequent human action. Because the struggle for resources means, from a philosophical point of view, negating the will of another. Thereby the self-preservation considered legitimate by Schopenhauer is transgressed and others are wrong by placing my own will above that of another whereby the foreign individual is negated as a whole. Schopenhauer understands this negation of the will as wrong in a moral sense, as it relates to the will and the, act, and the actions of an individual and the consequences that follow. From the negation of wrongdoing, that is, the defense against an attempted encroachment, Schopenhauer gains his natural concept of right, which differs from Hobbes concept concept of right in that it can be derived from the a priori structure of the will and does not have to recur to external experience. While Schopenhauer accepts this differentiation between positive law and natural law in a pre-constitutional state, he ultimately places both forms of law in a dynamic relationship to each other and develops, for example, the state's possibilities for legal sanctions from natural legal mechanisms. I will explain that in my second part to which I will come now. So the second part is the genesis of the state as a prospective will negation. As we have seen, both terms wrong and right can be derived directly from the metaphysics of the will and its imminent consequences, which only arise from the affirmation of the will to live. The will as a thing in itself, however, is equally distributed within the, the phenomenal world by the individuation principle among all its representations. And in this singularization, the very, the very same will turns against itself, reflecting the contradiction of its innermost essence. The metaphysical deficiency which Schopenhauer establishes in the essence of his concept of will, therefore leads to innerworldly difficulties and principles of right can consequently be understood as negations of metaphysically prior basic determinations. For Schopenhauer, the natural state of the world is characterized by constant injustice and constant encroachments of human beings upon one another. This Hobbesium bellum omnium contra omnis, which Rousseau still positively characterizes as the truly free state of humanity, is for Schopenhauer the normal, in this legal sense, positive state of the world, whose, der whose derivative correlate is the concept of right. The concepts of right and wrong in the narrower sense, however, Schopenhauer also determines positivistically following Rousseau and ties them to a state legitimized by contract theory. In the preceding state of nature, therefore, neither positively conceived right nor wrong can be spoken of in the proper sense, since the individual have, have not yet agreed on a contract among themselves and are in so far not yet legally mature. Quote, this purely moral meaning is the only one which right and wrong have for man as man, not as citizen, which consequently would remain even in the state of nature without all positive law and which constitutes the basis of everything that has therefore been called natural law, but would be better called moral law." End of quote. Right and wrong are thus as morally understood concepts of universal a priori relevance, since they concern both the affirming will itself and its manifestations in time. In so far as the will affirms itself beyond the limits of its own body and negates another will, it commits injustice whose negation is in turn right. 
while force as intrusion into another's will in favor of my own is wrong in moral terms, even beyond contractual assurances, Schopenhauer determines the subsequent counterforce as protection of my own person as rightful. The concept of right and subsequent uh, justification of the state contract is to be understood as positive in so far as it concerns the, reaction, uh, the reactive negation of a preceding violation of my person and therefore neutralizes injustice. So, for example, when I fend off or when I put a robber to flight, I don't commit injustice, but uh, respond in an adequate way to the injustice of, an, of a foreign aggressor. Schopenhauer now gains the justification for the state contract from this moral metaphysical foundation of the concept of, right, of wrong or right. Whereas for Kant, the concepts of right and morality must be strictly distinguished from each other, for Schopenhauer, they are directly connected which makes any separation appear artificial. For Kant, the concept of morality is constituted by moral insight into the rightness of an action out of duty, while the concept of right correlates with laws and punishments within a just institutional structure. Schopenhauer, on the other hand, defines his concept of morality metaphysically in terms of will as the existence of a wrong against another's will, which I exploit as a means for my own ends, to which the concept of right connects as the cancellation of this preceding wrong. The institutionalized form of this concept of right then manifests itself positively as codified law in the form of a state contract, which is designed to restrict all selfish shenanigans concerning their consequences with respect to all participants. One can determine the difference between morality and law in Schopenhauer as opposing but interrelated concepts. While morality addresses man's voluntative dispositions and actions, law is concerned with the resulting sufferings and consequences of those actions. Therefore, the state as a legal form appears explicitly as a negation of individual transgressions, which are understood as an expression of exurban affirmations of will and accordingly deny the will of others. The basis of this theory of the state is the selfishness of each individual, which as such only becomes problematic as soon as it interferes with another's, with another's will in favor of, my, of its own. If this basic constitution is recognized and elucidated by, re by means of reason, the state appears similar to Hobbes as a contract between reflected individuals who in this way transfer the individual selfishness into a legally organized community, which regulates the particular egotisms of the participants by contract. From Schopenhauer's point of view, the state can be understood as a restriction of self-serving action in so far as it does not elevate itself to a moral institution that seeks to instruct its citizens in moral matters, but rather represents an alliance of ends among selfish individuals. Its goal is to ensure the naked survival of its self-involved individuals among themselves, thus enabling weaker individuals to realize their own interests. In this sense, the task of the state lies precisely not in a reduction, but in a sublimation of egoistic individual interests, enabling each individual to pursue his own ends undisturbed. Now, human action analogous to, to Schopenhauer's concept of the world consists of two fundamental moments. First, the intelligible character, which determines the basic tendencies of the individual will. And second, the external motives that enable the activation of this volition. While the first moment is significant for the individual in its negation of will, the state in its will affirming function refers to the second factor and accordingly considers only the external motives of our actions. Following these remarks, Schopenhauer determines the state organized punishment as an, as an end for the future, which is to remain the individual of the fulfillment of his contractually assured, uh, remind the individual of the fulfillment of his contractually assured duties and to prevent the violation of the state contract. In this respect, the positive law in the, formal, in the form of the penal code only fulfills the purpose of deterrence as a negative general pre prevention for all citizens of the state, whereby the potential offender is to be deterred from giving free reign to his destructive urges. In this way, the potential victim is protected and can in turn pursue his or her selfish interests, uh, interests undisturbed. This preventive theory of punishment holds up to the respective egoistic motives of citizens, a counter motive expressed in the form of punishment, which precisely by restricting particular, particularistic volitions allows general self-interest to flourish better with common boundaries and protects individuals from one another. 
I follow with this um, the theory of uh, state prevention sta uh, put out by Oliver Hallig and Norbert Hörster, for example. The state thereby demotivates the, quote, enjoyment of the occasional wrongdoing, end of quote, by holding out the prospect of imminent pain to the actors through punishment. Therefore, for Schopenhauer, the purpose of the state is exhausted in a legally organized and socially acceptable compensation of the pleasure seeking of its citizens. Which respective retribution cannot be a purpose of punishment, according to Schopenhauer, since it seeks to compensate the past suffering with additional suffering, and in this respect parallels, uh, parallels revenge. In this context, he explicitly opposes the Kantian retribution theory of punishment as, quote, merely retribution for retribution's sake, end of quote, and calls it groundless and false, since no crime can be neutralized or atoned for in this way. With a Kant really just has a retribution theory is another topic. I don't think this is quite accurate, this characterization of Kant. A prospective retribution theory of punishment is not explicitly stated by Schopenhauer, but it could be interpreted that the retribution can be understood positively as an expression of, uh, of state of sovereignty with respect to temporal justice within the state. Schopenhauer doesn't actually say this explicitly, but I think there would be a possible interpretation for for that. Now, within the theory just outlined, the state appears as a rational product, but nevertheless as an instrument in the service of the will to live. The purpose of the state lies in the avoidance of suffering and not in the liberation from the will to live, which is why even a perfectly organized state is not a salvation from mundane complaints and grievances. Rather, in statehood, Schopenhauer sees the pragmatic wisdom of reason at work, which in principle can make the will and life-affirming coexistence of purely self-serving individuals bearable. The will itself remains untouched by the state. Quote, reason recognizes from this that both, in order to reduce the suffering spread overall and to distribute it as evenly as possible, the best and only means is to spare all the pain of unjust suffering by the fact that all also renounce the enjoyment obtained by wrongdoing. This means, therefore, which is easily devised and gradually perfected by egoism, which proceeds methodically through the use of reason and abandons its one. Sides, uh, its one-sided standpoint is the state, treaty, or the law, end of quote. This quotation illustrates the instrumental role of reason whose practical value is exhausted in the coordination of egoistic individual interests. Unlike for Kant, practical reason does not at all show itself to be a moral authority for Schopenhauer, although in a certain way, it limits the will in its extreme forms of expression and prevents the right of the strongest. But by doing so, it merely helps the human mode of existence to a more tolerable form of being that ties egoism and the affirmation of the will to certain conditions. According to Schopenhauer, the only source for moral action lies in the recognition of the principally negative structure of the will as the, quote, cause of all evil, end of quote, which must be denied in its entirety. Which brings me to the transcendental or metaphysical part eternal justice and individual negation of will. In Schopenhauer's theory, the state is based on the reflected insight of selfish individuals who can better pursue their, differ uh, their different interests through mutual constraints. Schopenhauer's political ethics differ fundamentally from Plato's or Hegel's conception of the state in that individuals as masters of the treaties are ultimately bearers of, overall institu of the overall institutional structure. Whereas Plato and following on from him Hegel essentially conceived of the state as the bearer of ethical value predicates that precede the particular individuals as a general moral substance, Schopenhauer determines the political community as a reasonable means to a certain balancing of interest in a metaphysically based cruel world order. The state then is precisely not, as in Hegel, an a priori end in itself, imposing on its individual as their highest duty to be citizens of a state and to accept its rules. In the same way, Schopenhauer deviates from Plato, who, although his cardinal, his cardinal virtues, wisdom, fortitude, and prudence, and their decisive coordinating substrate justice are also addressed to the individual, the individual nevertheless can only realize these virtues as a citizen in a polis. Accordingly, to Plato and, uh, accordingly both Plato and Hegel 
conceive of an ethics that locates its primary scope in a political community, be it a modern state or a polis. Schopenhauer, who erroneously refers to Plato in this context, conceives a political theory, but not a political ethics that determine the state as a moral substance. Schopenhauer's political theory can therefore only be appreciated as such when viewed against the background of his metaphysics of the will. The will, which is in itself blind and purposeless, objectifies itself at the highest level in man's selfish mode of action, the optimal realization of which is accomplished by state institutions. In this respect, the state itself is neither a condition nor an end of moral will determination, but creates a certain degree of justice through a balancing of interest of selfishly minded individuals. The justice produced in the state through its penal legislation is one that is realized in time, mediating between the injustice of the offender and the suffering of the victim. This temporal justice that is applied within a state is, however, only a superficial one, since the realization takes place only in the spatial temporal world of appearances and does not affect the essential aspects of the will as a thing in itself. Within the phenomenal mode of cognition following the principles of sufficient reason, human beings as, human beings as isolated individuals are not grasped in their fundamentally metaphysical meaning. This mode of cognition, bound to the world as representation, sees in the single individuals radically separated subjects and not their original unity as objectified manifestation of the one undivided will as a thing in itself. Thus the state and its temporal justice treat the unlawfully accept, uh, acting per, uh, perpetrators and their victims as two distinct individuals, whereas from the eternal perspective of the metaphysical will, both are regarded as objectivations as one uh, of one and the same fundamental principle, which identifies both with each other in essential respects. Uh, in essential respects. The phenomenal cognition of the world at the guide of the principle of sufficient reason, which underlies the temporal justice of state punishment, therefore fails to recognize the essential identity of perpetrator and victim, which is founded by Schopenhauer in a higher metaphysically conceived unity. For the will as a thing in itself objectifies itself equally and undividedly in all its individual manifestations, which is why Schopenhauer anticipates in addition to in a worldly temporal justice, a will metaphysically conceived eternal justice. This eternal justice, of course, can only be, be brought about through the metaphysically inspired view of the will as a thing in itself and not its institutional state appearance. Since the will as a thing in itself is not subject to the necessary mechanisms of the appearance of the appearing world, but merely documents its visibility within the very same world, it is one and the same in every individual. Perpetrator and victim, tormentor and tormented are therefore identical according to their willing essence. Only our mode of knowledge caught in the Principium Individuationis maintains the radical separation of both individuals without recognizing the essential source of their pain. However, when it is recognized that it is one and the same will that accompanies all lusts, desires, and sufferings, then it also becomes clear that the will that practices injustice and the will that suffers injustice are intrinsically the same. From this perspective, the just balance between tormentor and tormented is always, is always already given. Rather, the perpetrator hurts himself and the victim from, the, from this timeless perspective and internal justice reveals itself as a perpetual metaphysical zero-sum game. Now, Schopenhauer's conception of eternal justice may sound cynical against the background of real atrocities of historical magnitude and, well, be of little comfort to the concrete victims. But Schopenhauer's point here is not to balance out the wickedness of certain individuals with the suffering of others in a really misplaced philosophical calculus, but to show a way out of an ultimately in a, in an inescapable spiral of suffering that leads Schopenhauer from a life affirming political ethics to an individual ethics, aiming at the complete negation of the will which ends all human suffering. As already indicated, the state is neither willing nor able to bring about lasting justice in a Kantian-like ideal of the highest good. Therefore, Schopenhauer ultimately prioritizes the individual as the principal subject of ethical value predicates. The understanding of this metaphysically founded constitution of the world as will can ultimately only be accomplished by each individual and presupposes a modification of our mode of insight, which beyond the principle of sufficient reason is able to see the essential in the manifold, i.e. the will. 
This mode of cognition which Schopen are partly associated, associates in practical terms with a saint who makes all suffering in the world his own. He connects with the intuitive knowledge of ideas which, platonically speaking, exemplifies the fundamental general unity as the archetype of the species, in this case the human species. Quote, but the eternal justice will only be grasped and comprehended by him who rises above that knowledge which is progressing at the guide of, princ uh, of the principle of sufficient reason and is bound to the individual things, who recognizes the ideas, who sees through the principium individuationis, and who realizes that the forms of the appearance do not belong to the thing in itself." End of quote. I guess the parallels to Plato here are pretty obvious since Plato has um, more or less a rising philosopher who rises out of the cave and sees the idea of good and Schopenhauer has the rising philosophers who actually overlooks the pr principle of sufficient reason and rises above the phenomenal world to see or actually to to recognize the world as a thing in itself. I think the parallels are pretty, ob uh, pretty obvious here. Now both the artist and the saint are bound to the cognition of ideas while the philosopher can only express these ideas in a mimetic conceptual imitation, as Adorno would say. This form of the intuition of ideas, which, uh, which each individual can only accomplish for himself, illustrates in practical terms all the negative implications of, of a metaphysically damaged life, which can ultimately be overcome only by the complete negation of the will to live in one's own body. The practical negation of the will, uh, the will to live is now the ethical attitude that Schopenhauer demands or better describes. He actually doesn't have or claims to not have an, a normative ethics. Beginning with the intuitive realization of eternal justice, which Schopenhauer summarizes in the sentence, the tormentor and the tormented are one or tatwam asi, an empathic attitude of the subject takes place, which now identifies the will uh, as the source of suffering and mortifies it in its own body. The insight into the nature of the will and the cynical seeming eternal justice leads to the fact that the world no longer offers the same motives that activate his will to live, but triggers a quietive or a negation of the will. Schopenhauer's thought of redemption takes off with the theorem of eternal justice, which transfers the, uh, the individual self-negation of the will into the final phase. The modified mode of cognition, which starts with the intuitive contemplation of ideas and ends in the insight of eternal justice, initiates a staged process of negation of the will, which ends in a total quietive or negation of the will, which Schopenhauer determines simply as nothing. Well, now I'm coming to my conclusion. Um, it has thus been shown that Schopenhauer's political theory can only be understood against the background of his metaphysics of the will, which ultimately makes existence appear as a purposeless context of suffering. In this context, the state is determined as the result of an affirmation of will by rationally acting egoists, who can thus better pursue their own interests. Moreover, in this context, Schopenhauer demonstrates his conception of practical reason, which deviates maximally from Kant, functioning neither as a source of moral insight nor as a ground of knowledge of freedom. For Schopenhauer, practical reasoning consists rather in abstracting from immediate passions and rec reconciling the immediate consequences of my action with my long-term interests. The state has to be characterized as the rational result of self-serving considerations whose real purpose is the optimal satisfaction of its citizens' needs and their mutual protection. Therefore, for Schopenhauer, the state is not a moral institution and thus not a bearer of ethical value predicates. The state justice functions as a calculated deterrent mechanism designed not to educate its citizens through the threat of punishment, but to demotivate them in their basic urges. For this reason, Schopenhauer conceives of a higher form of justice, which in turn can only be comprehended from the basic tenets of his metaphysics of the will and relates specifically to the individual. Presupposing the thesis that the world is in its origin nothing but will, all individuals as well as collective wickedness and the pain associated with it show themselves to be expressions of one and the same will, which is directed against itself in the appearing world. Thus the perpetrator and the victim are not different subjects, but expressions of one and the same will, which eternally suffers everything it causes. From 
from the inside into this ineluctable constitution of the world, which in its core consists of suffering and individually accomplished redemption can only be realized by a complete negation of the will in one's own body. Schopenhauer's theory shows paradigmatically how genuinely philosophical, universal, basic determinations can come into connection with individual worries and fears. In this theory, the a priori structure of our will advance, advances to the basic principle of statehood, which re relates directly to individual needs and fundamentally establishes the political relevance of law as well as punishment. Moreover, Schopenhauer's theory of the state also un unintentionally, I think, incorporates an enlightenment moment into its consideration. Unlike Hegel, the state is not conceived here as an a priori end in itself that citizens must uncritically accept on moral grounds. Rather, statehood is shown to be a morally neutral instrument of selfish individual interests, which is based on the, on the consent, uh, consent of its subject as masters of the treaties and therefore open to debate. We know this principle in the, in the European Union pretty well and it works. Furthermore, Schopenhauer incorporates his political theory in the basic structures of his ethics, which, however, must be characterized primarily as individual ethics and is thus addressed to the individual as a priority bearer of ethical virtues. Such principle attempts to justify ethical phenomena, as Schopenhauer pointed out, could hardly be underestimated, underestimated in the modernity for answering fundamental questions in today's debates, which often seem to drift into a certain moral relativism against the background of the sheer diversity of different and ethical conceptions. So the actual strength of Schopenhauer theory as a whole actually lies in a critically based universal thinking as an enlightened antidote to relativism, which as a topic for this colloquy, for this colloquio could not be more important. Obrigado por sua paciência. Bem, obrigado, professor de Brest, pela excelente conferência. Thank you very much for your excellent conference. É, bom, agora eu passo ao a passar o debate. É, é, nós temos uma inscrição da professora Sandra. You are going to... Sim, Ana Lúcia? Eu poderia só fazer uma uma breve interrupção para cumprimentar o professor Halles, que eu vi aqui, que está presente numa das janelinhas, agora não achei mais. O professor Oliver Halles. I want to greet professor Oliver Halles. I've seen him here and I want to, 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 to greet him and thank you and thank him for uh, the presence here in Colóquio. Thank you very much. It's, sorry, it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure joining you. Thank you very much. <laughs> hello. Hello. Thank you. Thanks a lot. É só Eduardo. Ah, claro. É, bom, então, é, há uma primeira questão da professora Sandra Shapshay. First question, please, okay. Sandra. Thank you. Uh, am I successfully unmuted? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rafael. That was a really, really fantastic, interesting talk. Um, I, I guess I have, uh, I have some very fundamental uh, questions and, and, um, and, and worries about it, though, because there, were, there, uh, there was one word missing from your, from your talk, which surprised me, which was mitleid or compassion. And since, uh, and, and since the aim of your talk was to connect uh, Schopenhauer's theory of the state to uh, his sort of fundamental um, natural uh, um, uh, views on natural right and in his ethical thought, it's kind of strange to me that compassion never made an appearance. And, and, but I, I guess I, if I understand you correctly, what you want to say is that um, so you really see the state as coming as as coming from um, his notions of right and wrong, which are ultimately grounded in his metaphysics of will. And you probably know where I I would come from. That I, I think actually his ethics is not uh, so much grounded in his metaphysics of will, but um, on my interpretation, it's grounded in a sense of uh, inherent value of the I and the other, um, ultimately grounded in something more like practical mysticism. 
Um, so I guess I'm, I'm wondering, um, uh, I guess uh, to, to answer, <laughs> to ask some actual questions, um, where do you see compassion and the, and the ethics of compassion as entering into your story uh, and, um, and, and so that's the first question. And then relatedly, um, can Schopenhauer's understanding of the natural concept of right and wrong um, be ultimately um, conceptually grounded in his metaphysics of will? Um, or do you think some kind of notion of uh, inherent value of, of other beings who's, who are capable of suffering um, is needed in order to ground uh, a truly natural conception of right and wrong. So I, I will start with the last one, if that's okay, and then I'll move on to your fundamental question. Oh, both are fundamental. Well, um, I think, um, well, as you know, as a, Kant, as a Kantian, I would say, yeah, it's, it's twofold. You have, you can derive the state and you can derive the conceptions of right and wrong within the appearing world. But I think to metaphysically ground them, you have to take a double perspective into account. Basically, uh, the world is a thing in itself and the world as representation. Now, the world is a thing in itself. You can only experience within yourself since everything else is mediated. Within the mediated world, um, right and wrong can be, can be observed but only as a spatio-temporal uh, uh, relation. Now, to really experience wrong or to really deduce wrong from a metaphysically prior nature, you need to um, sort of <clears throat> you need to sort of look into yourself. You need to feel right and wrong within yourself, and you can feel that both ways. I think Schopenhauer um, says that in his in his deduction in paragraph sixty-two. Um, you as a as a wrongdoer you actually feel the injustice within yourself since you can recognize the other one by feeling within yourself but you experience it within space and time and then you in, you just enjoy it but only the subject as sort of a double uh, which uh, can have the double perspective with, within this uh, with to the thing in itself and to its own objectivation is actually a basis for this twofold um a deduction of right and wrong. But I think ultimately what Schopenhauer would aim to is that um, n noticing um, in oneself the, the perspective of the will and the will being the more fundamental um, notion, the metaphysic, uh, the, the world that we see in front of us is actually metaphysically grounded within certain limits. We cannot explain it in abstract concepts because of the Kantian critique. But um, we have to see it as the underlying, um, the underlying conditions for this world. And since these conditions are basically negative, um, the concept of wrong is the first um, in, this, in this sense and a positive negation. And then the other one are, can be deduced from it. Um, your second question, um, the concept of compassion. Well, as you realized, I sort of ended actually where this perspective would start. The insight into uh, eternal justice, I think makes um, one first step into a stage process, a stage process which first has compassion. And then after the insight or the looking through the principium individuationis would be um, compassion and afterwards the negation of the will. But uh, this would be the starting point for me now. I think for a state, actually, he doesn't need the concept of compassion to, to, to deduce his state, uh, his state politics. Oh, could I follow up just briefly? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's I think um, in some ways, I think a, a missing piece of your story, though, is one that maybe one only gets from, from the essay on the basis of morality. Um, because Schopenhauer gives actually uh, in that in that uh, essay this thought experiment between Caius and Titus, mm -hmm. he gives a pretty good um, phenomenological description of someone who's who is thinking about doing wrong to the other, right? To kill the uh, Titus is thinking about killing the rival, and then is stopped, and he gives a, a phenomenological description of from Titus's perspective, and it sounds. Uh, and so his, um, his account of someone coming to the idea that 
um, you know, it would be wrong for me to kill my rival. Uh, he says, I was, Titus says, I, you know, I was seized by compassion and I could not do it. I said, so in some ways, I think, I think the, the, at least in that essay, the concept of compassion is very central to the, the um, first personal perspective of potential wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, I, I kind of think that the, the compassion might be more, more important even to, the, to getting the whole um, uh, argument for the state off the ground and running. Mm. Well, I, I think you're right if you leave the state out. Um, now my topic now was the deduction of the state and you're right in the, in the grounds of morals, he doesn't talk about the state. He has a complete individual ethics there, which is, which is also very, very mystically uh, at the end since he since the, the compassionate individual basically oversees a metaphysical unity, but he doesn't actually clearly state what it is. And notice also that the methods are quite different in, in the, uh, the, his essay on, on the grounds of morals and in the world as well and, uh, and representation. Uh, on grounds of morals, he says he has an analytical method, whereas in the world as well and representation, he has a synthetic me method, meaning that in the world as will and representation, he actually um, starts from a metaphysical standpoint and then from there on grounds morality within passion. So he has the whole at first, then goes through the particular um, to get at the individual at the end. Uh, it's the other way around when he go uh, in the grounds on morals. He, there he starts actually at an empirical basis from, from the individual, then sees that the empirical basis is not enough and then goes from there to um, the metaphysical basis through compassion. Within, uh, within compassion, he says one can actually, like you said, uh, watch the unity between all people or can watch the idea actually, so the platonic thought idea. But I think it's just two different methods that come to the same end, just if you take the analytical perspective and you take the, uh, the individual ethics that he stands for in the grounds of morals, you just don't get a state, you don't need a state if you have only compassionate beings. That would be my answer. okay one one last very quick follow-up but i know there are other questions but um i i think in some ways though the um e even in on the basis of morals he talks about how the state can do a lot of good for um for ethics i mean not not for um actions of moral worth but for re reduction of suffering and mm -hmm. one and it, this is the only the other part of the talk that was sort of missing animals right Animals have rights for, for Schopenhauer as well, even though they'll never be members of the state. And the state ought to, he thinks, um, pass legislation for the protection of animals. And so in some ways, uh, um, the state can actually uh, reduce the suffering of animals by, by such legislation. So I think, I mean, there are sort of like connections between the ethics of compassion and the state, even in that essay that mm -hmm. might, I don't know, I think that complicate what you're trying to do here. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I'll turn my mic off. Okay, a quick response with animals, you're completely right. I, I, I didn't touch that. I, I said, though, in one thing, if um, I just said it in, in one or two phrases, that if one recognizes, actually, actually recognizes its unity, uh, the, the metaphysical unity, he recognizes that the, that the metaphysical interpretations would include everything that lives, I said. Okay obviously including animals, but you're right, I didn't touch upon that. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Obrigado, Rafael. Obrigado, Rafael. Rafael, você gostaria de fazer um resumo em português? Tudo. Oh, vou, vou Aproveitando o seu conhecimento em português, <laughs> eu acho. <laughs> vou tentar. Um, principalmente foram um, três perguntas. A primeira foi porque eu não uh, mencionei a uh, a, a compaixão um, na minha teoria porque porque ela acha que a compaixão é um, o elemento o conceito um, principal na ética do Schopenhauer e um, do conceito da paixão também se pode um, deduzir um, o, o papel do Estado e, e eu falei que a compaixão praticamente não é necessário para um, deduzir o Estado, mas é possível para usá-lo como uma ética individual. Aí sim é, um, é necessário, é indispensável. Ou seja, 
Ou seja, um, o fim, para o fim do Schopenhauer, a compaixão é indispensável, mas eu acho não para deduzir um, o Estado. Um, a segunda pergunta foi se, se é realmente um, necessário deduzir os conceitos do, uh, da justiça e da injustiça. Mas eu acho que sim, como kantiano, eu acho que uh, o papel fundamental da justiça somente é possível um, pelo reconhecimento uh, do mundo transcendental, com certos limites, obviamente, mas eu acho que isso é... É fundamental. Ele, ele acha que não que se pode ver vê-lo também no, no mundo fenomenal como como, como, como vemos cada dia. Um, a terceira pergunta uh, foi não sei o nome em português o fundamento da moral o, essa obra sobre é assim no fundamento da moral a compaixão um, também é usado para um, Animais. Para, para demonstrar o, um, o, a importância do Estado, eu acho que isso foi a pergunta, que a compaixão também pode ser usada para deduzir o Estado no, um, no fundamento da moral. Um, e eu respondi que um, o método nesta obra é diferente. Se se pode, uh, se pode deduzir o Estado sobre a compaixão, um, refletindo na unidade de toda a gente, mas eu acho que no, um, no mundo como vontade, lá o método é sintético. Você precisa de uma metafísica primeiro, que depois um, se refere ao particular, o que é o Estado, que depois se refere ao indivíduo o que é o fim da, da filosofia jovenauriana. Isso é. Ah, e por que não, não, não mencionei os animais? É, sim, não mencionei os animais, mas numa frase eu falei da, da unidade fundamental de tudo o que vive. Isso é um, e tudo o que vive é, também eu in, inclui os animais, mas sim, praticamente eu não, eu não falei dos animais, isso sim é verdade. Obrigado, Rafael. Agora nós temos uma pergunta do Felipe. Bom dia a todas e todos. Rafael, muito obrigado pela fantástica exposição. Me solidarizo quando você fala que é difícil encontrar pessoas que estudam a temática. Eu passei por isso, né? Desde a graduação me ocupo do tema e era difícil encontrar referências bibliográficas. Eu vou te fazer duas perguntas bem curtas e diretas, porque elas se relacionam com coisas que eu estou tentando desenvolver. Se você puder, pod, poderia falar um pouquinho mais sobre o papel do egoísmo na fundação do Estado, né? E você falou na sua apresentação do Aceta como aquele que melhor realiza a justiça eterna. Se você puder falar um pouquinho, você pode escolher uma das duas também, né? Mas eu queria te ouvir falar sobre isso. E agora eu posso tentar passar vergonha e verter para o alemão, e quando eu falar, o professor Jacóia me, me salva. Nur é, zwei kurze Fragen an Herr Gebrecht. Konnte Sie etwas mehr über die Rolle des Egoismus bei der Gründung des Staates sagen? Und der, die zwei, äh, zweite Frage, äh, der Ast, äh, konnte sie etwas mehr über den Asketen sagen, der Asket aus derjenige, der die ewige Gerichtigkeit äh, am besten verwirklicht. Ich weiß nicht, ich nicht in Deutsch machen, aber es ist eine Tentativa. Desculpa, gente. <lacht> Começou em português? Oh, assim? Acho que sim, né? Sim. Hum, o, egoísmo, o egoísmo. Eu acho que um, o, no, mundo como repre, uh, no, no mundo como representação, o egoísmo é a base fundamental um, para a existência do, do Estado. Então, hum? Isso é o, o cenário uh, hobbesiano do que falei. Um, indivíduos egoístas, uh, se você quiser, lutando todo o tempo, um, negando um, a vontade do outro egoísta, que depois vai fazer a mesma coisa. Isso é um, um, uma situação insuportável. 
e isso é, ou seja, o egoísmo é o que um, o que demonstra a, a necessidade do, do Estado. Um, mas no, no sentido individual, isso também tem certas um, tem certas implicações metafísicas, porque o egoísmo também não, não, somente, não somente provoca um prazer, senão provoca sofrimento. Nós todos somos egoístas, todos sofremos. E se, é uma, se, se essa é uma base metafísica, é um, um sofrimento permanente que nunca, um, que, que, nunca vai, que nunca vai terminar. Então, não sei, o, o egoísmo para mim, é, para mim e um, pela, uh, pelo papel do Estado é um, muito importante, é indispensável. Não, agora, o, o, o aceta, isso é para mim, se, se, uh, isso é para mim também uma questão um, individual, se a se o aceta hum, reconhece a unidade, da, a, a, a identificação da vontade como o mundo, aceita hum, essa identidade, hum, começa a negar todos os motivos internos e externos. Então, não somente negar o mundo, também nega uh, o seu caráter inteligível. E... Isso, para mim, é a essência do, do aceta, sem, não em termos um, religiosos ou em termos um, do budismo. É? Isso, isso é outra coisa. Mas, filosoficamente, eu acho a coisa principal é a única, a única liberdade que temos como pessoas é a negação do caráter inteligível. E isso é a negação de todos os motivos exteriores, todos os motivos do mundo como representação. Isso é a minha resposta. Muito obrigado. É que eu tinha pensado é, o egoísmo individual como algo ainda mais forte que o egoísmo coletivo esclarecido, né? porque hum. é, os indivíduos não aceitariam a, a instauração do Estado se não trouxesse, de fato, um benefício muito maior individualmente, né? individual. Hum. Obrigado, Rafael, foi muito bacana poder te escutar. Muito nada. Um... Não sei se você quer fazer um rápido resumo yeah. em alemão, em inglês, talvez. Sim, sim, eu uh, wiederhole isso noch mal ganz schnell, also genau die Fragen waren ja klar, ob ich noch ein bisschen mehr den Egoismus und dann den Asketen oder die Rolle des Asketen erklären könnte. Und ich sagte, also der, zunächst sagte ich, dass der Egoismus für mich und generell auch für die Genesis des Staates ähm, also nicht wegdenkbar ist. Das ist der Egoismus zum einen in, persönlich, in persönlicher Hinsicht, aber auch zum Beispiel in der Welt als Vorstellung. Da hatte ich ja zunächst dieses, Hob, dieses hobbsianische Szenario erklärt, in dem eben gerade dadurch, dass der Wille sich in allen äh, Subjekten gleichermaßen objektiviert und alle Subjekte des Willens voll von Willen sind und den dann irgendwann früher oder später übertreten werden, dass das eigentlich dieses Grundszenario ist, was die Genesis des Staates auslöst, als Negation eben dieser persönlichen Willensüberschreitung. Das war die Essenz von dem, was ich als Antwort gegeben habe. Und dass deswegen der Egoismus für die Gründung des Staates sowohl als Staatstheorie als auch dann in individuell ethischer Perspektive eigentlich das entscheidende Moment ist. Was den Asketen betrifft, ähm, war meine entscheidende Antwort, dass, diese, ähm, dass die Rolle des Asketen jetzt jenseits ähm, buddhistischer oder hinduistisch-teleologischer Lehren, wo ich nicht so firm bin, aber aus philosophischer Sicht eine doppelte Negation eigentlich bedeutet. Zum einen die Negation des intelligiblen Charakters, der sich dadurch selbst aufhebt und dadurch auch die äußeren Motive eben von sich fallen lässt. Das heißt, es ist nicht einfach nur ähm, eine Gelassenheit, die Verzicht in der äußeren Welt bedeutet, sondern es ist eine fundamentale Negation des eigenen Charakters, aber eben des intelligiblen Charakters und nicht nur irgendwelchen in der Zeit auftretenden empirischen Genüssen, sondern die Ganzheit des Charakters wird negiert. Und das führt auch dazu, dass jede Art von ähm, von Genuss, von, von Genuss und äh, sonstigen Bestrebungen eben in der tatsächlichen Welt auch keine Bedeutung mehr haben. Das heißt, es ist wieder so ein transzendental-philosophisches Moment eigentlich. Durch die Negation des intelligiblen Charakters aufgrund von Einsicht 
wird eben auch, ähm, sind die Motive, die quasi in der tatsächlichen Welt einem vorgehalten werden, nicht nur von Relevanz. Das war, glaube ich. Okay. Obrigado, Rafael. Agora, o professor Matias Costa, o professor Costa, tem uma pergunta. Bitte. Jetzt ist an. Bin ich zu hören? Ja. Ähm, ich habe eine Frage verbunden mit einer Bemerkung äh, zur, zur Kritik von äh, Sandy Shepshay und zu ihrem Vorschlag, äh, das staatliche Recht oder den Staat in äh, den Mitleidsbegriff zu begründen, das halte ich für problematisch, weil für Schopenhauer die, es sehr wichtig ist, Moral und Staat auseinanderzuhalten. Das ist das, was ihn von Hegel unterscheidet. Also das würde ihn mit Hegel sozusagen in einen Topf werfen. Und ich denke, der Punkt, an dem das entschieden werden kann, ist der Unterschied zwischen freiwilliger und gezwungener Gerechtigkeit. Gezwungener Gerechtigkeit gehört zu dem Bereich, in dem der Egoismus bestimmt ist, in dem keine Fundierung in, in dem, was im Mitleid liegt, gegeben ist. Umgekehrt, die freiwillige Gerechtigkeit, die wird, das ist auch das, was dann in der, in der Schrift über die Grundlage der Moral aus Mitleid abgeleitet wird. Das ist auch korrekt. Und meine Frage an Herrn Gebrecht wäre jetzt, warum er nicht auf diese Unterscheidung zwischen freiwilliger und gezwungener Gerechtigkeit eingegangen ist oder ob er da eine Möglichkeit sieht, seinen Vortrag vielleicht noch ein bisschen zu konkretisieren. Ich glaube, auf die, also auf die gezwungene Gerechtigkeit ist vielleicht auf Englisch nicht so herausgekommen, aber da bin ich, glaube ich, im zweiten Teil durchaus eingegangen. Die, ich hatte die gezwungene Gerechtigkeit auch als, wenn man es will, gerechtfert, als, als gerechtfertigte Reaktion auf eine äußere, auf eine äußere Aggression beschrieben. Und hatte dann auch gesagt, dass eine solche Art des Zwangsrecht, wie das Schopenhauer auch nennt, für Schopenhauer durchaus legitim ist. Die freiwillige Gerechtigkeit, das hatte ich vielleicht aus Zeitgründen dann am Schluss eben nicht mehr, also die ganzen die individualethischen und auch wahrhaft freiheitlichen Aspekte hatte ich am Schluss meines Vortrags nur angerissen und nicht mehr wirklich ausgeführt, weil eben die ja, die Genesis eigentlich der Staatstheorie bei mir dann eher im Mittelpunkt stand. Deswegen hatte ich den letzten Punkt äh, nicht mehr genauer adressiert. Hm. Okay, danke. Aber es wäre, ich denke, es wäre ein wichtiger Punkt, äh, hm. gerade in dieser Frage der Begründung von Gerechtigkeit, dass da eben zwei verschiedene Begriffe bestehen und dass man die beide verschieden begründen kann und begründen muss, um sein, seine Staatsphilosophie ja. dann richtig darzustellen. Das war mein Punkt gewesen. Ja, ja, ja da haben Sie recht. Das könnte man, das könnte man zum Schluss auf jeden Fall nochmal anhängen. Ja. Okay, danke. Rafael, wir machen ein kleines Resümee in Portugiesisch. Ah, sí. Um, primeiro, o Professor Costa estava falando sobre um ponto que, que faz o Professor Achemchei e falou que um, deducir o Estado um, do, do conceito de compaixão seria um, um paralelo com Hegel e isso não é a intenção de Schopenhauer, porque o compaixão ou o Estado que é moral e que tem compaixão dentro de si mesmo não é um, um Estado não é um Estado hegeliano e não é o Estado que, con, que conceptualiza Schopenhauer. Um, depois, eu não sei se conheço os términos em português. Ele me perguntou por que eu não uh, distinguia entre os conceitos da coação, zwangsrecht, coação, coacação em português? Coerciva, coercitiva. Coer, coercitiva. coercitiva. Ah, sim, entre o conceito co, coercitivo e o, um, a justiça voluntária. E eu disse que isso, foi, isso seria uma, uma diferença também entre o, o Estado como baseado no, na ética individual ou, ou coletiva, e por isso não, não o atrecei, mas ele me falou que é uma, uma diferença, uma distinção fundamental para, para deducir o Estado, então se pode... 
deduzi-lo de, de duas maneiras diferentes e por isso essa, essa distinção é importante também para deduzir o Estado. Então, sim, vou, vou pensá-lo e vou agregá-lo. Obrigado, Rafael. Nós temos uma última pergunta para encerrar, que veio do, do canal do YouTube, que é do Antônio Alves. Ele pergunta se negar o caráter inteligível não seria algo que entre em contrariedade com o determinismo moral. Ele é, diz que está querendo dizer o seguinte, como posso ter o poder de escolher, negar algo que já está pré-determinado ou que é inteligível? <risos> Assim, isso, é, uh, isso também é um problema kantiano, né? entre o determinismo e a liberdade. Hum, para Schopenhauer, uh, a liberdade de negar tem que é, é, somente existe se eu nego o, o meu caráter em total. Se, se eu nego a vontade em total e se eu nego o meu caráter inteligível. Hum, no mundo físico, isso, isso de, de fato não é, um, um, não é algo livre, verdadeiramente livre. No mundo físico, todo é, para Schopenhauer, determinado. É uma perspectiva, de, uh, é uma diferença de perspectiva e não uma, um, 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 um fato real. No mundo, no mundo dos, dos fenômenos, tudo é determinado, tudo segue na, na, na causalidade. Mas no mundo in, in, inteligível, se eu troco a perspectiva e vejo a coisa de uma forma inteligível, lá a liberdade é possível. Mas para Schopenhauer, somente é, consiste na negação do meu caráter completo como pessoa. Para Kant é diferente. Para Kant, a, para Kant, a liberdade consiste em... O Kant fala selbstanfang, espontaneidade, espontaneidade pura. Isso é para Kant, como um pensamento. Um, como razão, como ideias, neste campo, se somos livres, se, você, se, se a gente conceptualiza ideias morais para a moralidade. Para Kant, isso é a liberdade que é inteligível. A liberdade não se pode ver, mas se pode pensar. E um, por esses pensamentos podemos também determinar nossas ações. Para Schopenhauer, não. Isso é impossível. A, a liberdade para Schopenhauer também é inteligível, mas é, é, consiste em uma negação, não mais. Para Kant seria a espontaneidade, espontaneidade intelectual. Um, só de quantos? É. Oh, oh, tá bem. Bom, dado o adiantado da hora, eu, eu vou sugerir que a gente passe agora a palestra do Felipe. Eu não sei, Rafael, se, se você quer fazer uma, uma, uma transcrição do que você acabou de falar para o inglês ou para o alemão. Para o alemão? Sim. Um, de frage va wie Also die Frage ging auf den alten Unterschied zwischen der Freiheit in der determinierten Welt und der Freiheit in der gegebenen Welt. Also wie kann man überhaupt, ähm, wie kann man überhaupt ähm, freie Akte durchführen, wenn doch sowieso alles in der äh, Welt als Vorstellung oder wenn sowieso alles determiniert ist, also das alte Determinismusproblem. Ich habe mit Rekurs auf Kant darauf verwiesen, dass es eben, dass es wichtig ist, es so zu begreifen, dass es eine, immer eine Hinsichtenunterscheidung ist. Das heißt also, in der, sowohl für Kant als auch für Schopenhauer, in der Erscheinungswelt, in der Welt als Vorstellung, ist alles determiniert, und zwar nach strengen Gesetzen der Kausalität. Was Freiheit ist, bezieht sich auf das Intelligible, sowohl bei Kant als auch bei Schopenhauer, auf den intelligiblen Charakter. Die Art der Freiheit ist allerdings eine andere. Bei Schopenhauer ist für uns als Person die einzige Freiheit besteht darin, unseren intelligiblen Charakter zu verneinen, während für Kant zum Beispiel Freiheit als transzendentale Freiheit selbst anfangen wäre. Spontanität zum Beispiel, in der, zum Beispiel in, im Entwerfen und spontanen Entwickeln von Ideen sieht Kant einen Freiheitsbegriff. Wenn die Ideen moralisch sind, sind sie sogar dazu befähigt, uns in der, moralisch, äh, in, uns in der sinnlichen Welt zu bestimmen. Kategorische Imperativ ist ein diskursiver Vernunftbegriff, der spontan entwickelt wurde. Ähm, Aber diese Art von Freiheit, die, 
meines Wissens jedenfalls, die konzipiert Schopenhauer so nicht. Für Schopenhauer ist die einzige Art der Freiheit, die wir als Person tatsächlich feststellen können. Deswegen können wir uns auch nicht von einem kategorischen Imperativ diskursiv erziehen lassen. Vernunft ist dazu nicht befähigt, ist dementsprechend eben die Negation des intelligiblen Charakters durch die Erkenntnis ähm, des allumfassenden Prinzips des Willens. Des Willens. Also das war mehr oder weniger meine Antwort. E muito obrigado, Rafael, mais uma vez pela conferência, pela mediação, pela tradução. Né? Foi um prazer todos nós estarmos aqui ouvindo sua, sua palavra e agora vamos passar. Eduardo, Eduardo Sim? obrigado a vocês. Carlos, Eduardo, oi. É, só para observar que eu não estava brincando quando disse que ele falava tão português, português tão bem quanto nós. Sim, é verdade. É um português excelente. Muito bom mesmo. Então, agora, bom, thank you very much, professor Gerbrecht. É, agora vamos começar aqui, fazer uma interrupção e começar daqui a pouquinho a palestra do Felipe.